All right, welcome to the channel, everybody. Welcome to first, a first for me and a first for this channel. Today is my inaugural podcast, and I've decided I'm going to call the podcast Tethered. Now, you might be thinking, what, what are you doing recording podcasts? Well, the truth is, it's very difficult to go out and shoot on location at the minute here during lockdown. I can still do it, but I want to supplement that work with something else, something I can do from here at home in my office. So I've decided I'm going to start a series called Tethered, because I, I feel like I'm tethered to my home. I'm going to start a series called Tethered where I hopefully chat to people who I respect and admire. And the first guest I wanted to get on was Nick Carver. Now, if you don't know Nick, I would suggest pausing this video right here, go into the description, click on the link and subscribe to his channel. His work's fantastic. He shoots primarily film, but he also shoots digital. But I wouldn't even think about, I wouldn't even let that enter your decision-making process as to whether or not you watch someone's content. The fact is, he's a great photographer. He kind of merges street landscape architectural bit of everything. He goes out camping in the wilderness shooting landscapes, but he is equally comfortable shooting in the middle of a city. Uh, he's very entertaining, educational, and his work's also very inspirational. So I would definitely, because he's got the triple threat, definitely go and watch his stuff. But without further ado, I just want to kind of get into this podcast. Now, I didn't want to ask set questions. I didn't want any kind of script. I just wanted to basically sit back and have a chat. And I thought the best way to do that is to get lubricated. So we each cracked out a whiskey and had a good drink. And I think you can see as the podcast goes on, it gets better and better. You know, we start to loosen up and it starts to flow more of a conversation rather than set questions. Um, so it definitely gets better as it goes on. But we talk, obviously, photography, film photography. We talk about quitting our jobs. We talk about lockdown. We talk about our vehicles, my camper van, his 4x4. We talk about our wives. We talk about, what else do we talk about? I've made a list. Oh yeah, we, we talk about filming in public and how horrific it is for both of us. Um, so yeah, I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna let this video play on um, and honestly sit back and just enjoy. It's a long one, so get yourself comfortable and hopefully you enjoy it. Let me know your feedback, please. Okay, you ready? Let's do it. Uh, all right, let's clap to sing. All right, Nick. It's uh, it's nice to nice to have you on the show. I say the show. This is this is the first uh, first time I've ever done anything like this. And uh, the truth is, it's pretty difficult to go out and do what I normally do here in the UK at the moment. So I just thought, what what better excuse to basically try and chat to the people that I very much look up to. And when we first jumped on this phone call. Um, oh, sorry, it's not a phone call when <laughs> we first jumped on this video. Um, I, you said that you felt like you knew me and I feel like I know you, and I think that's quite bizarre. Um, but I get that a lot with YouTubers because I've been following you for years, man. Yeah, it's, uh, it's funny when you reached out to do this, this uh, little video, video call thing. First off, I'm honored that I'm the, I'm the first one on the show. But um, yeah, it's funny. We've emailed back and forth a couple times and... Um, but we've never chatted face to face and it's never been been live communication. But I kind of felt like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be getting on the phone with an old friend because, you know, like w one of my very first YouTube videos, which was um, shooting in Alabama Hills, uh, you mentioned it in one of your videos. And then I think that helped uh, bring a lot of awareness to my channel because I, I think that's, you know, kind of where I started to get a little bit of momentum. And um, I think you mentioning it uh, helped a lot. But then, you know, as the years have gone on, you've been incredibly generous in terms of like talking about my channel, talking about videos, talking about my course, my online course and everything. It's just been, uh, I, I, I don't know you at all, but I feel like I know what kind of guy you are. And like, yeah, I know you're like a good dude, a solid dude. Yeah, I'm terrible. <laughs> uh, terrible guy. <laughs> a complete Awful. hack and a mean, yeah, ter it's, terrible person. Yeah. <laughs> It's quite funny because because you say that it, that I mentioned your channel and that was like gave you a, a boost and to me that's insane because <laughs> I, I think your channel is of the highest quality and it's people like you that should be way up there and it's kind of and we'll talk about this later but you know it's all it's algorithm based and and you know it's it's in a sense it's I feel like sometimes it's even potluck as to the growth of your channel and the size of you know, anyone's YouTube channel. But yeah, the, the quality that you produce should be way higher. 
Um, oh, thanks. But what I want to start with first and foremost is, um, well, where are you? You're in California, right? Yeah, I'm in Orange County, and um, so Southern California. Orange County. Most people would be more familiar with Hollywood or LA. I'm about 40 miles south of that. Here in the UK, it's very cold, it's very dark, it's about eight o'clock in the evening, and it's the perfect time for a nice drink. Now, I can't help but notice, and, and I hope this is on your camera because we're on different cameras here, such a professional, but I can see, it, I can see a bottle of whiskey behind you there. And yes. I know one of, your, one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite uh, things on your channel is when you do a video called Behind the Glass with a Glass, and you talk about photography, but you also talk about whiskey. Um, so I suggested that we each bring uh, whiskey and, and, you know, have a drink, have a chat and uh, take it from there. So what, what have you got? So uh, to set the stage a little bit for anyone who's, uh, you know, maybe also in England. So it's daytime right now. It's noon. It's technically after morning. So I can I can do this. Um, but we're going through a little bit of a heat wave right now. It's uh, it's about 90 degrees out right now. So Celsius, that's, I think, 32, 33, something like that. Um, so it's hot. Uh, normally when it's hot, I'll reach for, you know, tequila or tequila based drink because it's a little more up my alley and kind of the summer vibes. But I wanted to bring out this especially for this, uh, for this discussion. So I haven't covered this in, um, a behind the glass with a glass for one simple reason. I like it too much to encourage other people to go buy it because I don't want to <laughs> not be able to get it anymore. So uh, this is Blanton's. It's a single barrel uh, bourbon whiskey and um, it's from Kentucky. And uh, my wife got me this, not this bottle, but a different bottle uh, about four years ago, I think, for my birthday. She had read that it was, uh, you know, highly rated and all that kind of stuff. And she had a hell of a time finding it. It was very difficult to find. And apparently that's partly because uh, the movie John Wick you know, with Keanu Reeves, um, he drank some of this in that, and I guess that spiked its popularity and people kind of uh, rushed out to get it. But it's only been harder to get since then, so like every few months I'll kind of call liquor stores and be like, do you have any Blantons? And sometimes they'll laugh, you know, it's like, <laughs> no. Like they get a, you know, an allotment and they, they don't have any. But um, I managed to find one at a local grocery store. I bought it there, and then... Um, Funny enough, you know, one of my videos that I'm most known for is when I was shooting uh, Houston's Liquor, uh, the liquor store with the kind of burnt out sign and everything that was here yeah, in California. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that video as well. Yeah, that one was fun. And um, that liquor store is near where my in-laws have a condo. And um, I walked in there, you know, uh, a couple months ago or something, and I kind of jokingly asked them, hey, you got any Blantons? And, you know, thinking they were going to be like, no way in hell. He's like, yeah, we got two over there. Got one over there, so yeah, take your pick. So I, I snatched one up from there when I got it too. But um, to give you an idea of how much I like this whiskey and how special you are to me because I brought it out today, um, this is the whiskey I drank on my wedding day. Ooh. So it goes, it goes my wife, Thomas Heaton, right, right. there. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so glad that I was below. <laughs> I was like, dude, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Well, you play your cards right, you might get above. Oh, nice. I was on a photography trip in Northern Ireland uh, with a bunch of guys. Um, it was part of a conference. And they got me absolutely hammered on Bushmills. <laughs> and usually when I get hammered on something, I, uh, I, I then tend not to like it, right? But this is, the, this is the only thing I've ever been hammered on that I've then continued to like. But the worst thing is, I, we were all drinking uh, we drank so much and then they all we all had a photo shoot planned the next morning and I was staying in my camper van um, And I just remember like people banging on the door like three guys banging on the door Because I was supposed to be the leader, right? I'm supposed to be the lead photographer and I've drank so much of this whiskey <laughs> That they are waking me up saying the sun's rising and so I'm like, oh my god It was the worst photo shoot I've ever done cold like Northern Ireland in October man <laughs> 50 mile an hour winds, freezing cold, battered by sea spray. And oh, it was awful and I was so hungover. But anyway, that's my story. Bushmills, Bushmills Irish whiskey, very cheers. nice. Oh, well, cheers. Yeah, cheers. Your channel is phenomenal. Your photography is excellent. Your eye for detail uh, is, is fantastic. What I love about you, your photography and your channel is the fact that you, you, you don't, 
uh, how can I how can I say this without sounding rude? You're quite cynical in a good way, in a good way, right? You, you're not afraid to speak your mind. You're not afraid to be a bit sarcastic and a bit funny, and quite dry. And I absolutely love that, and it comes across so well on your channel. Um, and I also think it yeah it comes across in your photography because you made a video about um, oh man what was it? it was you made a video about processing and and you know talking about why you don't process your images or Photoshop them. And you made some really, really good points. And, and one of the examples you used was when the uh, the big lorry or the big truck pulled up outside of the liquor store when you were shooting it. And you said the difference between going, because you paid the guy $20 to move, right? Yeah. yeah. Which, it was just blew my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I, I couldn't have done that at all. And I was so impressed. <laughs> Um, I would have just waited and I would have just had all of this anger inside of me and all of this rage <laughs> and then I would have just left. But the fact that you did that was fantastic. But you said, you know, I have no problem asking him to move, but you would never go and move, for example, a traffic cone or anything on the other side of the street because you were photographing the fantastic liquor store. And, and I love your, um, the purity of your photography in, in a sense. And if something's there, like a, a, a trash can or something, then it's there and it's part of the scene. And I really respect that. And that's something I struggle with because I am I can be a bit heavy handed with the clone removal tool. Uh, but after watching your work uh, and seeing your photographs, I definitely now try and stay away from that as much as possible. Hmm. That's, uh, well, thanks for all the very kind words, first of all. Um, yeah, the I've been doing this for so long now. I mean, I, I got into photography 20 years ago, and um, you know I've been doing it for a living since 2006. So I've gone through so many phases and so many just complete 180s on philosophy and, and approach and all that kind of stuff. And I'll have such a definite way I think it should be done. And then fast forward two years, and I have completely changed that, or I've completely modified that so that I'm not so hard-headed about it. And I've kind of, and also doing the YouTube stuff has really, I guess, made me more open to it's okay how other people want to do it. It may not be the way I do it, but it's okay that they want to do it that way. There's plenty of room for all of us. Um, but when I started thinking about like, well, why am I unwilling to move certain things but not other things? And um, I think it was a, a good thing for me to establish in my own head because I find myself walking the gray area sometimes where, you know, I might have a scene set up and it's like there's this car I don't like. They're not really part of the scene per se, but they would be there if I wasn't there. So is it okay for me to tell them to move? And so I've kind of had to just draw firm lines on like, okay, if I'm there first and it's clearly just a block uh, like the truck blocking my view, then I'm okay with that. But if it's an intrinsic part of the scene, I can't, I can't really touch that. And the, the, the whole paying the truck driver 20 bucks, I'm, I'm sure people on YouTube think I'm like money bags carver or something like that, <laughs> but that's, that's all I had on me. And I, I'm so, uh, I'm generally cripplingly shy, uh, except for on YouTube videos. Um, in fact, one of the guys I, I work with and do architectural photography with, he makes fun of me for it because I have this YouTube personality where I'm much more uh, outgoing and, and talkative, but generally in life, yeah, I'm it's, so... it's easy when no one's around. Yeah, and you're talking to a camera, and you, the the idea that people are going to be watching is so abstract that you don't even really factor it in, but um, I feel bad even asking people to move their car. How... How do you, uh, you, you, you're like a, an amalgamation, not amalgamation, that's probably the wrong word. You, you're a mixture of architect, I think you said this in a recent video, you're a mixture of architecture, landscape, and street, right? That's kind of what you do. You, you merge those three genres, um, or you certainly dip between them. Um, now, I am very good with a camera and a video camera when there's nobody around, okay? But recently I've had to go out and shoot in more populated areas because we have travel restrictions here in the UK. And man, I struggle so bad if there's people watching me or if I feel like I'm in the way or if I feel like there's, there's people around me. I've seen you in central reservations between two main roads, taking pictures, talking to the camera, 
you just don't care. I'm like, how does he do it? <laughs> like you, you'll you'll set up in, in a busy and and I know, I know what it takes to make videos, right? You've got a you know you've got a camera. You've probably got a dead cat on the camera, so it's it's you know it stands out, yeah. and you have to move your camera from position A to position B. You talk to the camera, and you do it on the street. Um, and that's something I've forever struggled with. Um, yet you just do it so naturally. It's uh, it's so nice to talk to someone who can relate to how awkward and uncomfortable that that is. Because that is my least favorite thing. I hate it. I hate it so freaking much. That's part of the reason I will do dawn shoots on those things. Is there's just fewer people out. But I have to. It, sometimes it takes like every every bit of my energy. To, to tamp down the shyness that, that comes naturally, to go out and ta- and set up a, a big goofy camera like my my large format, and then right next to it a video camera that's got a big microphone, and it's like I'm I'm doing so many things to attract attention, and I have such a hard time talking to a video camera when someone is right there, it, it feels like the most embarrassing thing ever, and my wife could attest to this because she's always offering to help me make videos and I always tell her no I can't I can't do that because you'll be standing right there and I'm going to be talking to a video camera like that's I'd, I'd just be crawling out of my own skin like it's so uncomfortable but uh the if the picture is good enough that I really want to to do the video that'll overcome it but um yeah it's completely uncomfortable and I I every time I make an online course video I say it's the last one I'm going to make because I get so uncomfortable and I get so frustrated with stuff like that. But um, yeah. I'm glad people like it because yeah. it makes the work worth it. Yeah, I mean, it's fantastic and you can't tell. I the work, There's two scenarios that I cannot stand. One is I will be making a video and the place is empty, right? It's empty and I'm making this brilliant video and then all of a sudden a coach party will turn up and there'll be 30 people around me, but I've got to finish the video. I have to finish yeah. it. And I'm like, if I don't do this last piece, it's done. I can't. So I have to just do it. And I'm like, and it's awful. And another one, the worst one is if I'm out and um, I'm, you know, I'm by myself and maybe in, in the woods or anywhere and I'm talking to the camera and in the corner of my eye, I can see someone coming around the corner. I'm like, oh, shit. oh no, no. And I just freeze up and it's horrible. And I try to keep going and I can't. And Oh man, it's just there's, there's there's two ways around it. One is to be in a foreign country where, for some reason, I do it better because I assume they don't know what I'm saying. Um, and the other is probably to get drunk. <laughs> yeah, that's really all that would handle it. Except when I do a dawn shoot, it feels weird to tip back one of these at you know 4 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, I tell you, it, you you uh, you had you did one great thing. You uh, you wore a high vis jacket. Genius. Yeah, I've I've uh, tried to fly under the radar by making it look like I'm supposed to be there. And you know, you see these. There's all these videos on YouTube. YouTube that like people will test where they can go as long as they're just carrying a ladder and they have a you know security vest on. They'll walk into yeah. like high end restaurants and hotels and all this kind of stuff. And it's funny to watch, but it's it's so true. What attracts people's attention is why are there two tripods in a in a guy's wearing civilian clothes? Like that doesn't that doesn't add up. So. I, I've toyed with like ha- even having a hard hat on and just making it look as much like I'm a surveyor as possible, and then people might leave me alone. But um, then you're self-conscious about the fact you're trying to be someone else, and it's like it's making YouTube videos is like the most uncomfortable, awkward thing ever for me. I don't know how it is for you, but like, do you have to get over the fact that you're like this is a viable living for you and you're actually out there working and it's not just playing? Yes. Yeah, so it's interesting uh, that you mentioned that because I would, <laughs> this is going to sound awful and and quite uh, self-deprivating and it's going to sound awful to all the other YouTubers out there. But I see you as a real photographer, okay, <laughs> a working photographer. You have your, uh, you have your business, you photograph for clients, architectural photography, um, I know that you're now moving out of your office, but you've had an office for like, what, like nine, 10 yeah. years or something. And of course you do YouTube, but I see you very much as doing YouTube to to market or to supplement your photography business and not just as a standalone product. Whereas for me, I feel like 
Um, I, f I don't feel like I'm a proper working photographer because I solely rely on YouTube um, for pretty much everything. You know, everything stems from YouTube. Um, whereas, whereas what you do is, is completely different. Um, and I really respect that. Um, oh, thank it, you. It's interesting because right now we're, you're only in the UK, you're only allowed to leave your house for exercise, um, essentials like shopping. Um, and if you're working, right? So I'm always in this gray area of, am I working? Yeah. And of course I am. My, my, my entire income depends on putting out YouTube videos. But people don't see it that way. So I'm in this gray area. And at the minute, I'm still in the, you know, I haven't crossed over to the other side. I haven't been out with my camera, but I probably will have to at some point. And it's going to be really interesting to gauge the reaction of the general public mm. and my audience. Um, now, how how's things in California? But I have no idea. I mean, I, I avoid the news, to be honest. I haven't watched news now for probably since March. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, California is interesting because it's, it's such a giant state and people don't realize that they don't live here but i mean the difference between just los angeles county and orange county which we're bordering is it's completely different it's like driving into a different country so like los angeles they're not allowing outdoor dining they're like everything is shut down you can't really do anything but then you just cross an imaginary line in the sand to orange county and they're not supposed to be doing outdoor dining, but they basically came out and said, we're not gonna enforce it because you guys need to make money. So you can go outdoor dine most places and um, barbers are shut down, but yeah. there's no <laughs> there's no restrictions on uh, on where you can go. And what you, yeah, I know, like I'm, I'm looking <laughs> super emo. I look like I'm in My Chemical Romance right now because I, I just haven't gotten my hair done. But um, yeah, it's, it's much, um, you know, America, is just kind of funny in general because we have, we have such a middle finger to the government built into our DNA. You know, I mean, that's what this country was founded on is, you know, yeah. an F you to the king. So I feel like it's just in our culture that whatever the government tries to tell us to do, we're gonna tell them, no, we're not doing that. So it's like, no matter how many restrictions they come out with, like people end up fighting it. <laughs> and I don't know that that's good or bad. I'm just saying that's kind of the way it is. And um, it, it's, Luckily, hasn't been too too much of a problem in terms of work. I'm still able to make an income, which is uh, very fortunate for me. Well, that's what I was going to say. I was going to ask if it affects your photography because um, for myself, um, it's, it's bizarre. It's um, like legally, I know that I'm solid. Like I can go out and shoot and, and it's absolutely fine. But I always feel uncomfortable because I worry so much about how, how the general public perceive me. Um, so if I'm out there, you know, if I'm out there driving 50 miles to go and explore some, you know, even if I'm in the middle of nowhere and everything, it's still just, it feels off. I don't like it. Um, that's why I've never been to the Faroe Islands because I've heard lots of stories about um, it all being private land and that the locals don't want you there. I don't know if that's true or not. I have no idea. But from people I've spoke to who have been to the Faroe Islands, they say that they've stopped to take a photograph photograph, and the landowners have come charging out and, you know, get off my land you know, kind of thing. And so I, I need to be completely free and easy when I'm out with my camera, which means no people, no breaking any laws, no trespassing. So, I'm, yeah, that's why I'm having a hard time. Um, it's really difficult. So I think at some point I'm just going to have to make a choice. I imagine for you too, it probably, you, you, I'm sure you enjoy very much what you do and everything. So when you're out doing something you enjoy doing, it's hard to classify it as work. Yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, even if you're technically following the rules and everything, it's like, well, I'm also just kind of having funsies here because I, I like making <laughs> YouTube videos and I like, I like taking pictures. So it's hard to justify it. But that just means you succeeded in finding something you enjoy. <laughs> That's a good sign, though. That means you found a source of income that actually makes you happy. I know. It's like I'll say to my wife, oh, I'm just going to I'm just going to go to South America. And then when I get back, I'm just going to go on a 10 day camping trip and all this. It's work. It's work. It's not. It's, yeah. she's, she's like, that's not work. <laughs> Nobody sees it as work. It's hilarious. And it's because it's kind of not. I'm just very lucky. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I mean, that's that's a big, big struggle for me is if, if I was, mi well, to be fair, I am miserable a lot of the time, but if I was really <laughs> miserable going out, then I'd probably feel less bad about going out when perhaps, you know, 
people think I shouldn't be. I don't yeah. know. Anyway, I don't want to get into politics. I was just curious yeah, yeah. about how um, how it had affected your photography. Um, for me, it's it's pretty devastating, as it is for a lot of people. But at the same time, you know, you just adapt. I don't know. We'll we'll see what happens. Um, well, you're doing you're doing that with uh, with this year. I mean, this is a, a great way to turn lemons into lemonade, man. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is uh, the the YouTube stuff too is great because I mean it's evergreen. It's always out there, and it's just continually attracting more people. And I'm sure your channel is just continually growing because you know you have a lot of good content out there, so people can go down a rabbit hole and just watch Thomas Heaton videos for 24 hours straight, yeah. and they're stuck at home too, so they got nothing else to do. <laughs> I don't know why so, I would um, do that. You've put, put yourself in a good position. <laughs> yeah, it's true. In fact, give me two, I'm just gonna stop and start my camera. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I'm actually gonna flip, flip the screen around so it's a battery. So yeah, you mentioned um, evergreen content, and it's interesting because um, when I'm out making videos, that's why I don't talk about gear too much because I always want to keep my content. I try and make content for people 10 years down the line with the hope that it's a future investment, you know, like evergreen, like you said, evergreen content. Now with yourself, uh, for anybody who doesn't know your channel, uh, you shoot film, um, m mostly anyway. Um, yeah. It's quite funny because you've, you've shot some amazing stuff on digital, but this whole kind of, of digital film, I, I don't see that. I just see like photography, the stuff you shot in Paris, after the riots was phenomenal. Thank you. Phenomenal work. Thanks. I, I was I was just I saw that and I was I was kind of angry <laughs> because I had I would never have thought of that or seen it or and it made me want to go out and shoot street stuff, you know? Um, that picture with the dress and the smash window was just absolute top draw. And I think it's that um, that type of photography that just makes you stand out well thank you um as, as a photographer and of course you know all the other stuff that you've taken um you did a piece in the Mo mojave mojave, mojave desert yeah. uh, the the big panel with the beautiful soft light shot on portra 160 yep that's right good memory <laughs> yeah but it, it's all fantastic work um and I, I know you've mentioned this before but you said um is it true that you you'd almost given up on photography until you rediscovered film yeah yeah absolutely so yeah. um you know it's funny earlier you're talking about uh you know not feeling like a real photographer or whatever because it's all youtube based and, and all that um i went through that feeling for years because i was exclusively teaching photography so i i didn't this is before i got into architectural photography and i was just doing classes and private lessons and online courses and that's that was my sole income and I constantly had this, like, you know, I'm not a real photographer kind of feeling, even though my income was based off of photography, technically. I, I wasn't shooting for anybody. Um, and that time period led to a, a burnout where I just, I wanted to, I wanted to give it all up because um, my pictures weren't really any good. I wasn't evolving as a photographer at all. Um, and because I was just teaching people how to take pictures and I wasn't really going out and taking pictures myself uh, all that much, um, it completely lost all the fun because I was showing people all the, you know, quote unquote tricks and tips. I hate that term, tips and tricks, but showing all the little things you can do to make a, a landscape more epic or whatever. And it was all becoming very um, paint by numbers, I guess you could say. And then uh, I was getting burned out from doing all that and I got to a point where I did, just didn't want to do it anymore. But I reached, I reached the point where I couldn't do anything else. I couldn't turn back because I was dependent on the income now. And you know, I didn't have a college degree, I didn't have any other skills or anything like that. So I just kind of wanted to stop, stop doing it, but I didn't have that, that wasn't an option. Um, but then that was just like right at the very, the very start of film coming back. Like, uh, I, I think a lot of people don't remember this, but there was a time where film was just, I, it was dead. Nobody shot film anymore, and it was it was gone for good. Everyone was, you know, convinced it was gone for good. And a few hipsters were keeping it alive, you know, with their fedoras and their 35 millimeter cameras, but um, it wasn't a thing yet. It, it hadn't come back yet. And luckily, right at the very beginning of that, I had, I had the thought that I, I need to start shooting film again. And... Um, as soon as I had the thought, I was I was handled, and I, I fell in love with photography again. And you know, I 
decided to try a bunch of formats I never tried before. I had never done medium format, never done large format. And I just kind of started digging deep into all these different formats and different options that were completely off limits to me as a digital photographer. And then that's been keeping me afloat ever since. And the, the YouTube stuff started purely out of, out of my excitement for getting back into film. Um, I never intended it to be anything that successful or anything that was a source of income. Um, I just kind of put videos out, you know, hoping I would connect with a few other people that were into weird cameras, you know, or, or getting into it like I was. Um, and then it, it's been keeping me afloat ever since. It's been nice seeing how, how much it has come back, film photography. Yeah, it, it's really interesting because I, uh, I guess a similar thing kind of happened with me. I just, I, I, had, I, I played around with large formats and, and found it too restrictive. And I know film is restrictive and that's part of the joy of it, but I found it really restrictive. Yeah. Um, and then like digital for me, I was just, I was losing the excitement a bit, which is very, it, it doesn't make sense really because I love photography, but I, I just felt like it was all too automated and too easy, point, shoot, sort it out later. So I wasn't spending the time really appreciating what was going on. And then I just had this sudden, like I, I literally, I was lying in bed and I just thought square format. And I think originally I was looking at Bronica, but anyway, I came across the, the Hasselblad. Yeah. And, and it, it was like this, this, I don't know, it's like I was awakened. It's so bizarre. I don't want to sound <laughs> pretentious. And you know, I can't even explain it. I cannot explain it. Um, but if, if, for example, if I'm going out on a photo shoot, I am way more likely to be super excited. Like, let's actually let me let me rephrase that. If the weather's crappy and I'm in an average location, but I want to go out and shoot something, if I've got my Canon, I'm kind of not that bothered. I don't. I'm not that interested. But with this, it, it opens my eyes, and I can't explain it. Yeah. I see images when I have this camera that I don't see with the Canon, and I don't know why. And I don't know why I love film, um, and I'm I'm only just learning. I'm new with it, but there is something about it, something that makes you appreciate every every little piece of photography, all the nuances, everything that's involved, the light, the tones, the colors, the choice of film, the framing, the composition, everything that you don't really consider that much when you shoot digital. And I do shoot primarily digital, so every time I go out of this camera, it's like I'm on holiday. That's a uh... It's fascinating to hear your uh, your story about having that realization because I had the same instance where I actually remember where I was sitting. I pretty much remember where I was, what I was wearing. Like I remember the moment so vividly when I decided to to start shooting film again. And like you said, it just felt like you know, it just felt like a weight. It just felt like something changed completely in, in me. Like the instant I had that thought, and um, it, it's just fascinating how much like just the thought of shooting a different aspect ratio like you had, you know, like, oh, just shooting square, like such a small thing can just completely rekindle the, the artistic fire you have that is just kind of coasting right now on digital or coasting right now on whatever you're doing. And it's like, oh, I could just try this one little thing. And then it's like the, the fire just flares back up completely. And that's one of the things I, I love about film is there's, whenever you hit like a you know, a dead end like that, where it's like, I've, I've done as much as I can with this combination of, of techniques. There's so many other options out there. It's like just in medium format alone, like there's 645, six by six, six by seven, six by nine, six by 17. There's um, rangefinder cameras, there's uh, field cameras, there's SLR cameras. There's so many different ways you can explore that format uh, not even to mention the different film stocks. So it's like, okay, I'll try high saturation. I'll try black and white. I'll try developing it myself. I'll try print film. Like there are so many avenues you can go down to rekindle that lost feeling. And I think most photographers reach that feeling at some point where they've kind of, they, they've reached the top of the flagpole and there's like, they, they don't have any other, any other way to, to get excited about it again. But then they have that thought, oh, maybe I should get a Hazzy, yeah. you know, or sh I should uh, try 645. And it's like, boom, it all comes rushing back. And I love that it's that easy to bring it back. And film really fosters that quite easily for me because there's so many, there's so much variety available. Yeah. 
I, I love how, because I've never been big into processing. I mean, I've tried it. I've tried Photoshop with, you know, your different layers and your layer masking and, uh, you know, putting in skies and bracketing and all that sort of stuff. And, and um, I, I always struggled with it and I never liked the end result. Yeah. So film is just encourages you to go the complete opposite direction. And I think that's for me why I got so excited. And I always encourage people just to, well, I say I always encourage people. <laughs> I've only been shooting film for a few months, but every time I do, I always say, Jimmy can pick up a cheap camera and give it a go. And in the, you know, the beauty of film as well is you're very much relying on your own skill and all the decisions that you make. Because I, I suppose this is a debate for another day, but there's not a great deal of processing involved and manipulation with film it tends to be kind of like especially with slide film you shoot the shot you shoot the film mm -hmm. and, and that's pretty much what you're going to get and i love that because it makes you really appreciate those perfect moments and people don't question film images if you see an epic shot on instagram you question it it's like <laughs> oh was that sky really that color but if you know if you yeah. say if you have an amazing photograph or a beautiful shot shot on portrait 160 no one questions it and uh, yeah yeah i love it i just I, I i have so much more to explore so much more to shoot i've just got my six by 17 back from the repair shop so that's all good i just need a bit of freedom yeah <laughs> i hear you now you you started you started on digital right uh actually no funnily enough i started on film oh really but this was back when, yeah well this was 20 years ago when i was 16 um, yeah, I was 16 and I got introduced to the dark room and a shot black and white film. I think it must have been on a, I can't remember the camera, um, probably a little Canon A1 or something. Probably an sure. AE1, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I, I, I shot film, I processed it in the dark room and, and uh, made prints and it was fantastic. But then Canon released the, uh, the Rebel something or other or the... I don't know. One of, one, of the, one of their early, more consumable digital cameras. And, and that was it. Never ever went back to film until very recently. And I tell you, it's just fantastic. Was that in school that they, uh, you got introduced to film? It was, yes. Yeah. Wow, that's nice. That's, um, I'm very fortunate that I, I got introduced to it the same way at school. And shortly after I got introduced to it, they, they did away with that program. So I caught it at the very end. But um, I hope schools are still you know, entertaining the idea of introducing kids to film photography. Because as you know, it's it's a completely different introduction to it, especially if you've only ever shot digital. It's a much different experience. Yeah, it's bizarre. It's like, a, <laughs> it's, gonna sound, it's probably the whiskey speaking, not me, but it's almost like magic. You know, it's like <laughs> magic. It's like digital is just on your sensor. You can see what you're shooting and there it is. But with film, the fact that you're capturing on emulsion, um, I don't know. It's just something special, very, uh, very analog, very hands-on, and I just love it. It just it feels more special. And people always say, "Well, digital's better quality and and whatnot." I don't know if that is probably 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 is true to an extent, but then it's almost clinical. I guess if you're comparing, you know, pixels to pixels, it, it could potentially be better. But um, I, I've had several viewers kind of comment on the fact, like, "Oh, you shoot film because of the resolution." Like they say that to me. And I've never indicated that's why I shoot film. I've never said that because that's definitely not why I shoot film. Um, but there seems to be this thing of like, oh, yeah, it's it's all about which one's sharper and which one's more megapixels and all that kind of stuff. But the reason to shoot film has n really nothing to do with that. Like, it's about the process of how the picture's made and, you know, not being able to look at a screen, not being able to look at results, you know, right away. Um, mm -hmm. And especially... You know, the challenge of um, trusting your technique more than trusting the histogram or trusting the screen or trusting the, you know, the, the settings that Canon has deemed fit or Sony has deemed fit or whatever. And knowing you can't just put the raw file in the computer and crank the shadows and fix your crappy exposure. Like there, there's all there's so much more writing on every every photo. And I think that's a, a fun challenge for people, um, or at least that's part of it. But the even large format, like you mentioned how restrictive it is, it is an insanely restrictive. <laughs> like you can you cannot set up a shot in less than five minutes, you know, if you're really fast, maybe five minutes. But it's the the lens is available, there's fewer, the compositions you can utilize are fewer, how long it takes to set up a shot. Everything about it is more difficult. And the resolution is better than most 
digital cameras, but I mean, how many people are actually using that resolution anyway? It's not like anyone's printing, printing huge prints on their, on their walls. I would argue and say that you use the resolution because um, you're one of the few photographers who, who I see uh, selling your work at art fairs. Um, I, I've seen a, a, you've made a couple of videos on your channel where you make prints and you sell them at fairs. And again, that's another thing that makes you, a, in my opinion, a, a real working photographer. You know, rather than just selling, you know, trying to get likes on Instagram or whatever, you, you, you go into the real hard work and the effort of producing these prints to sell. But saying that, you do it because of the passion, because no one's ever going to get rich from selling prints at art fairs because, well, as you know, yeah. the setup costs alone are astronomical. Um, but again, that's another yeah, yeah. thing that I ad admire and that would asp I would aspire to myself. Um, I just think it's, it's fantastic. Well, thanks. Uh, yeah, if you saw the balance sheet on doing one of those things, you might not think I'm a real photographer. <laughs> no, I know. It's, I, uh, I can imagine very <laughs> expensive. <laughs> yeah, it's a labor of love, though. It's fun to see stuff in print. I'm, a, I'm building a van at the minute, a camper van, and um, I've, I've got a spreadsheet. Every single penny that I spend on the van, I keep in a spreadsheet. And it's, it's tiny amounts, you know, screws, bolts, bits of wood, little bits mm -hmm. of pieces. And I've just... Uh, I've just um, done a complete total of the full cost so far and I'm just like holy crap how can so many <laughs> small components add up to so much money and I imagine it's the same with an art fair you know oh yeah although that brings me on to the subject um, now I, I don't have any set questions or anything like that but one of one of your uh, one of your videos that you released recently or certainly in the past few months that I just loved and have taken so much inspiration from and it's nothing to do with photography although it kind of is is your vehicle your truck because you do, the great thing about your channel is you're shooting the street, but you also do a lot of uh, camping and landscape photography. Um, certainly you have that in your back catalogue. And that's one of my favourite things to watch is just seeing anybody out with a, you know, in the wilderness with a camera and a camping setup. I just, I can't get enough of it. Uh, but your vehicle is, oh man, I was just so impressed. No, um, and I'm, I'm kind of building like a four by four mini off-road camper and I just watch your video and I'm like making notes going oh, I'm gonna get one of those and one of these and <laughs> yeah it's cool man very cool well thanks yeah that's it's been a it's been a nice truck you know it's um I, I'm envious of your van build if I'm honest I like the the truck I have the forerunner I have is is awesome but I the van way the the van life hashtag van life is really the the most convenient way to go. So my dream is to eventually have some sort of kind of four by four van, but, um, that the forerunner I have, which was in those videos is my daily driver. I use that to go to my architectural shoots and all that kind of stuff. And I have to make it kind of easily convertible, you know, for camping and, and, um, going to shoots. But, um, you know, I, I try and, I try and spend money on cameras and film, but the truck ends up probably eating up more of it because you know that by the time you put the rack on and you put all the equipment in there and everything it's like it's it's costing an arm and a leg to just to get out there but um yeah it's been it's been a good yeah, it's truck. addictive though isn't it because yeah it's you don't need you don't need all this stuff but you just see these cool gadgets and you think oh i'm gonna get one of those and, and that's what i'm doing anyway um but having having a place that, that could make me slightly more comfortable yeah yeah exactly that's what i'm like um, but I, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of in, at the point now where I don't spend money on things. I don't have many things. Like my phone is about six years old. I'm just <laughs> not into spending. I'm not very, um, I'm not driven by consumerism. Um, but I do like quite, quite like buying old things, like old cameras. And mm -hmm. my, my van is old. I think it's 20 years old or close to 20 years old. But now that I'm building it out, all of a sudden my inner consumer has been released and I'm buying like spotlights for the <laughs> roof and like ridiculous flooring and all these gadgets um, and it's overkill but uh, I think having a vehicle to be out on location a comfortable place where you can be close to where you want to photograph is one of the best investments you can make and it's a big investment of course but yeah. I suppose it doesn't have to be uh, but yeah just your truck man super cool uh, Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm very jealous. Sure, I'm going to be jealous of the van. But. Well, I'm jealous now, but yeah, I, I exactly. won't be jealous in about four weeks. <laughs> so on the van, is it? did you get the van just gutted? Like there's, it was just an empty back and you're, you're building it floor to ceiling the way you want it? 
No, no, I didn't. I didn't want to do that. I don't know why. I I just wanted to. I wanted a really simple build. So all I've done is taken the rear seats out. So it still has all the internal trim, but it's all insulated. I've put it, but everything that I'm building is modular. So it, you just unbolt it, and then it comes out. Um, so no, I, yeah, I just wanted it to be simple. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's perfect. It's really small. I mean, your Forerunner is probably bigger, um, but it does have this. It has a high a high ish roof. Actually, no, it doesn't. It's a really low roof, but you can sit down in it and you can you can lie in it. Um, so yeah, I expect if you took the back seats out of your Forerunner and it would probably be a similar size, but it might have a bit more headroom. Being able to have just like a place you can sit with a little little table is huge when you're out camping and stuff like that. Like that's one of the biggest things I, I don't like about my setup is the only place I can just like sit down is outside. But if it's like rainy or buggy or something like that, like I just wish I could just go into like my cocoon and just sit down in a little little room to wait it out. But you know you gotta ha have to have a van for that kind of situation. Yeah, it's, it's it's brilliant having your own personal space and yeah, just being able to get out of the elements and some of a nighttime when you, you know, I can imagine I haven't done a trip with a film camera yet because of COVID, but uh, I can imagine just just sitting in the van, loading film, reading a book, having a whiskey. I mean, I, yeah, I, I sold my old camper van um, and I really miss it. I've not had that for about six months now, but yeah, the van life, man, it's. Uh, it's just fantastic. And you're so lucky because you have the weather for it. We're always getting battered by storms over here. Yeah, we are We are lucky in California. We pay for it, but we're, we're lucky. Um, I do have kind of an, an odd question for you, though. So you, you go out and do these these things solo, typically, right? Always. Yeah, yeah, always. Um, do you, um, it, is that ever difficult? Like when nighttime rolls around, do you feel homesick or do you feel lonely or any of that kind of stuff? Because I get that real bad. And I don't know if that's unique to me or if most people get that. No, I, I get that a lot. Um, it generally, it, it it tends to sort of, it depends how well it's going. Like yeah, if, absolutely. Um, if, I'm, if, I'm just a, if I'm just away for three days and I've got phone service, like it's not a problem. You know, if I'm getting good light, I'll be calling my wife every day. I'll be telling her about the light, telling her about how productive I've been, I've been and, and all those images and videos that I've shot. But it, the worst thing is when things aren't going to plan, you've not been productive, you don't have cell service. Uh, it's just, it is hard. Um, but I think um, with the van, it's easy to just turn around and come home. Um, you know, I've been away on trips to South America for like a month. Hmm. And man, that is hard. Like really difficult. I do get homesick and that's why I'm not a nomad. You know, you get a lot of these people who live the, what do they call it? Like a laptop lifestyle where they- Oh yeah, dig digital nomad. I couldn't do that. You know, I like I like my chair. <laughs> I like my garage with all my crap in yep. it. I like, you know, I like my comfy sofa. There's no way. So, yeah, I do get lonely. Um, but only when things are going bad. Um, I, I guess the, the thing is here in the UK, it's a really small country, so you're never far from home. Hmm. Um, yeah, that's interesting. It's more when I travel overseas that it, it can get a bit difficult. Yeah, I can't imagine being, like, you know, in another hemisphere for a month. That'd be very difficult for me. I, I'm I'm like you. I, I tend to, I do really well having my my space at home and having my things in the garage and having the, you know, I know where everything is and I know where my my food is and I know where my next meal's coming and all that kind of stuff. I'm, I see people that are kind of the, uh, you know, wanderlust lifestyle and, whenever I see it on Instagram, I'm like, yeah, I want that life. I want to just like travel and just take pictures and travel. And then I get like a little taste of it by like going out for you know, a few days that's not even that far away. I'm like, I'm ready to go home. <laughs> like, I kind of I miss my own bed and everything. I'm, I'm the same. I, uh, I don't think I could travel full time. Um, but saying that, you know, I think the worst part is whenever I'm away for a long period of time, I'm usually running a workshop or working. So you, you kind of mm -hmm. have to deliver the goods, you know, you've got to be out with people socializing and going out for meals. And, and you do that every day for maybe four weeks yeah. in a foreign country far from home. Yeah, it's tough. But saying that, it's, you know, very, very lucky to be able to do it. So I never take it for granted. Um, but yeah, man, I tell you the worst, the worst time I've ever had was um, I I'd, I'd, I'd quit my job, right? And YouTube was now my full time business. That was it. I made the decision I was going to do YouTube mm. full time. This was in 2017, I think. And for my first kind of 
big YouTube job or whatever, you know, big project. Because, you know, up until that point, I'd just been doing weekends here and there. But now I was full-time YouTuber. So I went to Scotland and I went to um, an Outer Hebrides, which are these islands off the coast. And you have to get a ferry out to the island. And, and they're so remote and there's no one there. And they're incredibly barren and cold and windswept. And I remember getting off the ferry and driving across this island. It was raining. It was windy. It was barren. It just looked so depressing. And I had a panic attack and I was like, I just thought, what have I done? What the hell have I done? I, you know, I quit my job, my very secure job with good money and I'd quit it. And I just, I was horrible. Um, and I was, I'd planned to be there for about a week and I'd already pre-booked my ferry crossing. So I was kind of trapped on the island and the weather, the, the weather never stopped. The wind never stopped. I was staying in a tent it was just awful. I wasn't making good images. I wasn't making good videos. My camera broke. And that was the worst. That was the lowest point of my photography life, you know. Um, and I ended up coming home early. And yeah, well, luckily, it's been pretty good since then. But yeah, that was hard. And if you go back and watch those videos, you can see it. You can see I'm not happy. And, and I'm forcing the images, the images, I'm, I'm making the mistakes that I always tell people not to make. I always tell people, don't take an image just so you can finish a video. Never do that, because I've done that in the past. And if you watch my uh, stuff from back in Scotland a few years ago, you'll see the images are terrible. But I just felt I had to put something out, and that's such a terrible mistake. Yeah, yeah, I've I've had it had it hard a few times, but I'm also very lucky. So try not to moan about it too much. Jeez, man. Yeah, I would have crashed and burned in that scenario. That's like, because I remember quitting my job too. I mean, that that's a terrifying thing in the first place that you're putting all this. I don't know. You're putting a lot of faith in your ability to keep this gravy train rolling and to grow this big enough that it's going to be able to support you. Like that must have been a terrifying you know, decision just in its own right. But then like the first, the first step you take in pursuing that is a miserable failure, or at least it feels that way. Yeah, it, like, was, it <laughs> was, no, it was like, I didn't get any light, zero light. Uh, yeah. It was horrible. It was, but you know, you, what I've learned is that you just have ups and downs and, and because photography is a creative pursuit, whatever is affecting me personally will affect my photography. So, yeah. you know, I have, I have highs and lows and um, that affects my photography. You know, I can be in a great mood and I can photograph anything and make good images, or I can be in a, a really low point within my life, get amazing light in the most beautiful scenic place you've ever seen in your life. I just can't make it work. I don't want to be there. I don't want to shoot, but you kind of have to keep going. So I go through these cycles and the best thing I've found to do is to actually be open and talk about it on the channel. And mm. people really appreciate that. I think they appreciate the honesty and the vulnerability. So yeah, it's kind of cool. So I just ride it now. Hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, I should probably be more honest about that stuff in some of my videos because I'll have it where it's not going well, and I'm trying to salvage it. You know, I'm trying to turn it into turn it into something that is actually a good photo or a good good storyline. And sometimes it's just not going. But <laughs> I mean, I've had entire on location yeah. videos that I just scrapped. Like I, I got back and there was nothing. Nothing good about it, so I just never, never did anything with it. Yeah, I have a, I have a folder full of videos that maybe one day I'll talk about, but that <laughs> never made the cut. Um, I'm gonna, just two seconds. I'm just gonna hit record, mm. and it's got a 30 minute record limit for no reason. Um, <laughs> yeah, do you know uh, Simon Baxter? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, he's a photographer. He does a lot of he, he does a lot of woodland photography. He has a YouTube channel. You should definitely mm. check him out. Um, You'll, you'll love his stuff. He's very talented, but he doesn't upload very often, but we live quite close together. Um, so every now and again, we'll meet up and go on a shoot. And I'm now starting to suffer from the curse of Simon, where every time we go and shoot together, I never get a video, ever. <laughs> We've been in shot together now <laughs> so many times over like a three or four year period. And I now have a folder on my hard drive called Simon <laughs> And it's all of the shoots that we've done together and it just never worked out. <laughs> Um, it's not him, it's me. I don't know what it is. It's just like every time we go out and shoot together, he's like, did you get a shot? I'm like, no, <laughs> didn't happen. So uh, yeah, I've got, I have a lot of location videos that get scrapped. Huh, that's cool you got someone you can uh, go out and shoot with. People often offer to go out shooting with me and I never take anybody up on it because I, I feel like it's such a solo activity that 
I, I would feel like completely changed the dynamics if I went out with someone. Have you have you felt it's it changes your images or how you approach or anything? Yeah, it, it, when I go out by myself, I love to be indecisive. So I like to, you know, maybe go to one spot, then walk back to another spot, then back and forth, and oh, I don't know yeah, what I right. want to shoot. When you're with someone, you can't do that. Um, and also, I, I find talking to the camera, I'm much more open when I'm by myself. I mean, I have a lot mm -hmm. of fun shooting with people, I really do. And if they're like-minded and they're shooting YouTube videos, then yeah, it's great, but there's no way I'd do it more, you know, I wouldn't do it regularly. Maybe it's maybe a handful of times a year, it's really good fun. Um, but no, I, it is very much a solo pursuit. Hmm. Yeah, I feel the same way. I've even, you know, it's even hard to do it with my wife there or something, which I obviously love my wife and I love her company and everything, but, and she's super patient. She never like tries to rush me, but just knowing that someone is standing right there, yeah. it's like, I want to go check this spot and I probably come back to this spot and I'll probably go back to that spot. Like it feels like you're inconveniencing them. Man, when I think back um, about some of the photo shoots I've done with Charlotte and she's, man, she's so patient. She will sit in the car for hours, hours. <laughs> and she's reading the Good book because she doesn't mind. Yeah, she doesn't mind, and I'm so lucky. And that's something that I, I, I try not to take for granted. It doesn't happen very often, but it's more so if we go on a trip together, and I'm just like, oh, can I just go and shoot this? And you know what it's like. I'll be, I'll be five minutes. Yeah, like two hours later, you yeah, come yeah. back. <laughs> <laughs> that's photography. That's what I'm like. Yeah, my wife's, my wife's learned that that five minutes doesn't mean five minutes. So yeah, <laughs> she, uh, she knows it's, it's going to take a while. That's the same. She'll pull out a book. Uh, luckily, she likes to. <laughs> you know, drive and uh, see the scenery and whatnot. So I'm quite lucky. But yeah, I, I, if I'm by myself and I've got nowhere to be, no deadlines, I'm way, way, way happier, way more productive. I do like shooting with people, but I think it's more just I like hanging out with people. Um, I never, yeah. I never do very good work when I'm with people. I'm always worried about getting in their shots or uh, getting in their way or something. Yeah. So no, but it is good fun. But yeah, most of the time, just by myself. Yeah, I kind of have made a distinction between like photography trips and fun trips. So like I'll go camping with buddies of mine and I, I'll bring a camera, but I'm not there to take pictures. You know, I'll do something something quick maybe, but I, it's mostly there to hang out with them. And then if, I'm, if I want to go take pictures, I go out alone taking pictures. It's basically work at that point, but it, it's hard to, hard to mesh the two. I think I'm done. Empty. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I, I've got my wife waiting for me downstairs, so uh, this video is going. I could I could talk for hours. I could. It's been. I knew I knew this would happen. This is what I thought would happen. I thought when we started this, it would be a bit, you know, questiony. Um, but I feel like I feel like we've, yeah, I kind of feel like we've relaxed into it a bit now, which is quite nice. So I could talk for hours. Well, we can always always do it again another time. Yeah, we'll oh, pick for, it up. Sure, for sure. I, what do you think of the name as well? I've called this show, I keep calling it a show, I don't know what it is. But uh, <laughs> I've called it um, Tethered, because obviously that's a photography term. But I, yeah. uh, it's also like here with lockdown, so I feel like we're tethered to our houses. So I don't know, that's the name I came up with. I like that. Yeah, I like Tethered. Yeah, we're, we're, we're tethered, tethered to each other via the internet. So it all it all it all works out. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a thumbnail where me and you are like tethered to each other. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> that might be quite good. Tethered to Nick Carver. Yeah. Just ha make sure you're in front pulling me along because you're always giving me subscribers. Yeah, right. So yeah. I'll, you're always leading me into the world. With that being said, everybody should go and subscribe to Nick. He's fantastic. He does. Uh, well, I'm actually I'm doing my. What am I doing? I was going to do an end piece, and I'm kind of now just organically doing it. But yeah, go and subscribe to uh, <laughs> Nick's channel. He does landscape, architecture, street-ish kind of street. I don't know. I don't know what your genre is, but it's great anyway. It's um, landscape yeah, street. It's yeah, like sure. the principles of landscape applied to stuff on the street. I, I'm. I mean, I want to go and do it. It's just my town's not that attractive. But um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe that's that's what I'll do because uh, I can't get out into the wilderness. We'll see. Uh, but yeah, Nick, thank you so much. Um, it's been a pleasure. It really has. Um, and thanks oh, for being man, number one. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate how, how generous you've been to me over the years. You've you've pumped up my channel a couple times, and you've talked about my online courses. It's it means the world to me. It's it's a huge uh, huge reflection on your character. I really really appreciate it. So thank you. Well, no problem, and I appreciate all the hard work you put into your YouTube channel because it, it gives me hours of entertainment. And 
because of you, I can now <laughs> scan gonna... film to a, <laughs> a respectable level. So. Yeah, there we go. And of course, I've done your uh, metering uh, photography course, so now I can use my light meter properly. That's good. Yeah. Um, all right, <laughs> I, I have to end it. I'm just going to keep talking. So uh, yeah, cheers, man. And we'll do it again soon. Season two. Sounds good. Which will be lockdown, lockdown Christmas 21. <laughs> oh, God, don't say that. All right. <laughs> no, I, know, I hope not. All right, cheers, man. Thanks, man. Cheers. So I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Nick. Um, I enjoyed making it and I do want to do more. So if you know of anybody that you would like to see me get drunk with and have a conversation, just let me know in the comments. Um, I am reaching out to more people. Uh, to be honest, I'm not having that much luck in getting people on. Uh, I thought it'd be easier than this, but yeah, people don't, like people are busy. Um, so yeah, let me know your thoughts, but I do hope you enjoyed it. Um, and hopefully there'll be more of this to come. As ever, your feedback is massively appreciated in the comments below. So yeah, guys, thank you so much for watching and um, I will see you next time. Thank you.